Assalamu alaikum, good evening, uh, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Nasr Al-Jihani, consultant endocrinologist. First of all, I want to thank Prof. Ali Zahrani uh, for uh, arranging this very important webinar, and he bring a figure in thyroid cancer like Brian Hogan and uh, Prof. Ladinson. Uh, today, really, I will give uh, all the audience uh, just an introduction about the Arab Thyroid Association, okay? Uh, so the Arab uh, Thyroid Association is a non-profit professional health organization. It is created by a group of endocrinologists from Arab countries. It is specialized in the field of the thyroid and parathyroid disease. Its surface uh, cover all Arab countries. Uh, it was established less than one year in May 2021. This is our mission to improve the standard of healthcare provision in Arab countries to prevent, diagnose, treat various steroid and related disorder. Our vision to be the leading professional society in the Arab countries for supporting education and the training uh, of the physician and healthcare professional in the field of thyroidology. Uh, our value is a clinical excellence, continuous education, leadership, honesty, and collaboration, especially collaboration with the American Thyroid Association and European Thyroid Association, and also other associations in the Arab countries. This is our goal to organize and coordinate high quality scientific activities in Arab countries, to set high level of practice of standards of healthcare professional in thyroid and related disorder in Arab countries, to facilitate the collaboration and exchange of information among specialists in the field of local and international society to establish and guide public policies in various thyroid and related disorder to promote public awareness in the activity to support research in thyroid and related disorder. This is uh, the member, the current member of this association now, my name is Dr. Iman Saddiqi, Dr. Wiam Hussein from uh, Bahrain, Dr. Thamir Al Isa from Kuwait, and Dr. Ahmed Makin from Sudan, Prof. Ali Zahrani from Saudi Arabia, and Prof. Uh, Hussam Al Hawari from uh, Jordan, uh, Prof. Mohammed Lamki from Oman, Dr. Tariq Al Hid from Qatar, Dr. Tariq Nasser from Saudi Arabia. Dr. Khaled Al Dahmani from Saudi, sorry, from United Arab Emirates, Abbas Mansour from Iraq, and Prof. Ghada Al Khatib from Egypt, and Prof. Sami Azar from Lebanon. This is our briefest activities. We have almost um, uh, 42 faculties that contributed to our activities. The contribution from 33 uh, countries all over the Arab world. Uh, attend this more than 2000 till now we have eight events this is the upcoming next the first annual virtual thyroid arab uh, uh, arab thyroid association congress for two days in the 27th and the 28th of may uh, this is some of our webinars the previous webinars this is uh, wave six this is another webinar for pediatric thyroidology uh, this is the current webinar and this is a previous uh, thyroid academy, mainly for non-endocrinologists. We have five waves or five webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, at the previous time, webinar one, two, three, four, and five. First of all, I want to thank all of you to take from your time. And this is our website, arabthyroid.org. If you want any information, also we'll have all the recorded, uh, the recording of the previous activities will be available in the website. Thank you for you. Thank you all. I thank all the guest speakers and the Prof. Ali Zahrani. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasser, for a short and nice introduction of the Arab Thyroid Association. Uh, it's my great pleasure tonight to uh, welcome the audience and welcome our distinguished speakers from the United States and uh, from local, uh, locally here. And uh, we should have a very rich program today covering um, uh, different aspects of thyroid cancer from 
the simple cases to the most com complicated um, aspects of thyroid cancer management. It's really a great pleasure and honor for me to uh, introduce uh, my mentor and friend, uh, Professor Paul Leidenson, who is uh, John Eger Howard, uh, Professor of uh, Endocrinology and Metabolism, and Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, he obtained his uh, medical degree from Harvard Medical School, did his residency and fellowship at um, Mass General Hospital, and has been leading uh, the endocrine uh, uh, and metabolism uh, division at Johns Hopkins for the last uh, two decades. He just recently stepped down and he has taken that uh, division uh, to be one of the best um, um, uh, divisions or uh, practice, endocrine practice in the United States. Uh, Dr. Leidenson has many achievements and it would not be uh, possible for me to cover all aspects of his uh, professional uh, career, but um, uh, he, uh, he was past president of the ATA. He was the editor in chief of JCAM. He, was, he received several awards, including uh, Louis uh, Preferman Lecture Award from the ATA in 2012. He had several hundreds of publications in the most prestigious journals, including J JCI, New England Journal of Medicine, JCM, Thyroid, JAMA, and many others. His areas of interest is uh, thyroid and heart, thyroid cancer, and thyroid hormone analogs. And it's really a special pleasure for me today to introduce Professor Leidenson. So uh, Dr. Leidenson is going to talk to, to us today about hot topics in the management of thyroid cancer. Leidenson. Thank you very much, Dr. Alzarani. It's a, such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aljohani, for uh, being here to welcome me as well to your exciting new organization, which is like a lightning bolt in the, the way that it has started and uh, illuminated thyroid diseases in your region. I. Um, I'm delighted to uh, have the chance to talk with you about some recent developments in the initial management of thyroid cancer and uh, have decided to focus on the new knowledge uh, approaches and trends uh, that have an impact on our thinking about post-operative uh, radioiodine therapy uh, in the treatment of our patients with thyroid cancer. Um, I'm gonna also along the way be talking about uh, what I think many of us perceive to be a new era in prognostication about patients with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer uh, and the role of tumor genotyping in decision-making, especially in borderline uh, cases. Uh, I have no dualities of interest uh, today. Uh, I will be uh, mentioning a couple of off-label uses of approved uh, drugs, and you may be hearing even more about these topics uh, from uh, Professor Haugen. So we're gonna be uh, focusing really on the issue of thyroidectomy followed uh, by radioiodine therapy with a few comments about the role of radioiodine in treatment of uh, recurrent disease. Uh, and I'd like to frame our discussion this evening around a, a man, a 40-year-old man whom we recently saw at Johns Hopkins who had been incidentally discovered uh, to have a thyroid cancer based upon a chest CT scan to evaluate a cough. He had a sonogram that showed a moderately suspicious nodule sonographically, which was biopsied and promptly classified as a Bethesda 6 papillary thyroid cancer. He subsequently underwent an uncomplicated bilateral thyroidectomy with a very limited uh, selective central neck dissection. And his surgical pathology confirmed the presence of a multifocal 3.1 centimeter dominant lesion, a classical PTC that had clear margins and no 
extra thyroidal extension or lymphovascular invasion. The surgeon resected only one paratracheal lymph node and it was positive. And so his uh, staging then would make this patient a PT2 N1A MX uh, papillary thyroid cancer. And uh, the question after his initial treatment for which he was referred to our service was first, should this patient with his degree of disease have postoperative uh, radioiodine therapy for remnant ablation? As you all know, there are really three goals of postoperative I-131 therapy in management of patients uh, with thyroid cancer. Uh, the first and one on the front burner in this man's management was remnant ablation to facilitate uh, the detection of residual recurrent disease uh, by improving the specificity of subsequent thyroglobulin monitoring and the sensitivity of whole body radioiodine scans in the early postoperative manage management of such patients. Uh, the second goal is adjuvant therapy to improve disease-free survival by uh, uh, destroying suspected but unproven, in this case, residual disease, especially in patients who are at increased risk of such recurrence. And then finally, and apparently not yet relevant in this man's case, was uh, the goal of using radioiodine for radiotherapy to improve disease-specific and disease-free uh, survival uh, by treating persistent disease in patients uh, with higher risk presentations. Now, we uh, have been guided since uh, 2016 by the uh, second version of the American Thyroid Association's guidelines for the management of patients with thyroid nodules and cancer, uh, a process led uh, by my co-speaker this evening, uh, Professor Brian Haugen. And uh, that guidance from the 2015 ATA guideline uh, as we think about applying it uh, to this patient would uh, lead us in terms of his T status, his tumor size, to say that there was not a body of evidence uh, demonstrating convincingly that radioiodine postoperatively would improve his disease-specific uh, survival. Uh, the issue in this patient and what elevated his case from a clearly low risk to uh, a toe over the line into intermediate risk was the, the presence of cervical lymph node disease. But you can see the specification in the 2015 guideline uh, that this applied most convincingly based on uh, published data uh, to individuals greater than 45 years of age. I've, I've chosen this man's case because he is right on the fence in terms of decision-making about whether postoperative radioiodine therapy would have any benefit uh, to his health. Now, um, at the end of the spectrum, of course, there's little doubt that patients with a distant metastatic disease or widespread local tissue invasion incompletely uh, resected uh, would benefit from radioiodine therapy. Until very recently, this uh, guidance then, which is summarized in this table of uh, not routinely recommending radioiodine for low-risk patients, considering it in intermediate and routinely recommending it for high-risk patients, uh, th these recommendations have, as you can see, been based on weak to moderate quality evidence. And I, I want to show you one 
a relatively recent study that exemplifies uh, the kind of data uh, upon which Dr. Haugen's uh, guidelines group uh, based their recommendations. Uh, this is a, a study uh, from Dr. Sosa's group then at Duke of uh, almost 13,000 younger patients from a US national thyroid cancer uh, database around the turn of the century. And you can see among uh, such patients, intermediate risk patients, not unlike our case this evening, that there was a statistically significant but modest improvement in survival probability uh, among those in the dotted line treated with radioiodine. A difference that was more evident in the subset of 2000 patients who were greater than 65 years of age. Now, uh, these recommendations uh, have in the early years uh, before their articulation uh, been preceded by, in the United States, an increasing use of radioiodine in patients with intermediate and high-risk disease. What has been troubling, though, is the fact that despite these recommendations, you can see that in low-risk patients, those with tumors less than one centimeter, uh, there remained until uh, 2008, as shown here, extensive US use of radioiodine therapy. And the work of Dr. Megan Haymart at the University of Michigan has shown a light on this variability in practice that uh, extends across the United States and also in many other parts of the world. Uh, you can see that overall among hospitals treating patients with papillary uh, thyroid cancer in high-risk patients, uh, the, a median of 75% of patients were treated with radioiodine, but there was great variability, as few as 20%, and in some institutions, 100% received radioiodine. What is more troubling, though, is the fact that 37% of low-risk patients, for whom the guideline does not generally recommend radioiodine therapy, it was nonetheless administered. And and you can see that from institution to institution, from none to uh, almost 80% of patients were receiving radioiodine. Dr. Haymart uh, examined how to explain this variability. Only 21% of variation could explain by the factors one would think ought to be responsible, characteristics of the patient and tumor, 7% uh, was related to the hospital type and case volume, but almost a third was due to unexplained hospital characteristics. One suspects that hospital characteristic was simply uh, the bias of treating of uh, physicians. Now, the, one of the important reasons, of course, that this matters and that the uh, clear overuse of radioiodine in low-risk patients matter are the adverse effects associated with therapy, most commonly acute uh, sial adenitis and less frequently gastritis that give rise to short-lived and generally mild symptoms. Uh, it is generally only in higher-dose treated patients where we expect uh, the greater salivary complications of xerostomia and continued intermittent swelling. Although uh, we've all had cases where even a, a single low radioiodine dose has had this consequence. Uh, Dr. Richard Kloos and others have made us more aware of the ophthalmologic uh, xeropthalmia and tear duct obstruction that can complicate therapy with higher doses of treatment, uh, bone marrow suppression, of course, can occur, but generally not something of concern 
uh, with modest post-operative ablative doses. Transient oligospermia with higher dose therapy has been described. And I would just say in passing that we generally do not uh, advise or uh, provide services for men to bank uh, sperm as a result of uh, simply routine radioiodine therapy. But it's the issue of secondary malignancies, particularly hematologic malignancies that have troubled us the most. And I wanted to bring to your attention an important study from, uh, again, uh, Dr. Sosa and Dr. Kitta Hara's group at the National Cancer Institute that was published in January in JCO examining again the association between radioiodine treatment of thyroid cancer in pediatric cases and young adult cases and its relationship to secondary malignancy. And you can see among 27,000 survivors for more than five years of thyroid cancer, the median 15 year follow-up, uh, there was an increase by uh, almost 25% in the rate of solid malignancies. You can see here that significant overall increase in solid cancers. Among individual uh, tumors, only uterine cancer was significantly more frequent, but you can see that there was a tendency approaching significance in tumors of the salivary glands, stomach, uh, breast, and lung, all tissues that by virtue of the distribution of radioiodine uh, does expose those organs to significant uh, radiation doses. Um, the risks of total uh, solid tumors and female breast cancer, which was the most common uh, cancer type overall, were highest among the 20-year uh, survivors, emphasizing the importance in terms of not only science, but clinical practice in long-term surveillance of our radioiodine treatments. And you can see that that increased risk in the 20-year follow-up group uh, was approaching 50% for both all solid tumors and breast cancers. And Similarly, and well known from previous studies, hematologic malignancies significantly more likely after radioiodine therapy, particularly um, myelocytic and related uh, forms of leukemia. Overall, these investigators estimated that 6% of solid tumors and 14% of subsequent hematologic malignancies in this pediatric and young adult radioiodine treated uh, survivor group was attributable to radioiodine. Now, uh, with this knowledge, it was exciting to me that just two weeks ago, uh, I'm sure most of you saw in the New England Journal of Medicine, the emergence of the kind of evidence that we really need to refine our approach to radioiodine treatment after surgery. Uh, this study by uh, Professor Sophie Leveilleux, who spent a year of postdoctoral training with us at Johns Hopkins a decade ago, uh, a prospective randomized trial in which her group at Villa Juif outside of Paris assigned 730 patients with low risk differentiated uh, thyroid cancer after th thyroidectomy either uh, to low-dose uh, 30 millicurie, uh, 1.1 uh, gigabecquerel uh, therapy after recombinant TSH, and then uh, either with or without that th the therapy uh, followed patients for uh, three years of follow-up. Uh, these were uh, a decidedly low-risk subset of patients whose tumors were all less than two centimeters with no aggressive histologic subtypes, extension beyond the thyroid gland or lymph node metastases, and patients whose low-risk status was confirmed by a negative post-operative uh, neck ultrasound. 
uh, their hypothesis was that radioiodine therapy would be non-inferior uh, to the addition of radioiodine, meaning a difference of less than 5% with respect to a composite endpoint reflecting recurrence. An abnormal subsequent radioiodine whole body scan requiring treatment, an abnormal neck ultrasound, or an elevated thyroglobulin, which they defined as greater than five in the untreated uh, patients and greater than one in those who had been administered radioiodine with examinations at approximately one and three years after randomization. And here you can see the reassuring results of this uh, recently published study. Uh, no event of, of recurrence was detected in 95.6% of those who did not receive radioiodine and in 95.9% <laughs> of those who did. Obviously, uh, confirming the non-inferiority of withholding radioiodine after surgery in low-risk uh, patients. This uh, enumerates the events that we're seeing, and you can see that structural or functional events, in other words, an abnormal uh, sonogram or whole body scan, was seen in uh, five of the radioiodine-treated patients and only three of those who did not receive radioiodine. Uh, an incomplete biochemical remission, uh, in other words, a thyroglobulin over those levels that I uh, recently pointed out, uh, were equivalent in those receiving and not receiving uh, radioiodine. Um, so structural or functional abnormalities uh, occurred more often, of course, in those with a thyroglobulin signal on thyroid hormone therapy of a level of greater than one nanogram per ml. Uh, these investigators also looked at a subset of patients who underwent mutational analysis. Interestingly, uh, they found approximately, as studies from around the world had previously shown, that approximately half of the papillary cancers harbored a BRAF mutation, uh, but that the molecular alterations were similar in this study in patients with or without a recurrence event, and that events rates did not differ between groups according to their mutational status. Um, no treatment-related adverse events were reported, including in the radioiodine group, and there were no difference in qualities of life between the two groups. But these investigators, with this rigorous study, uh, like we need more of, showed that in patients with low-risk thyroid cancer, no radioiodine uh, therapy after thyroidectomy was clearly non-inferior to its use in terms of the functional, structural, and biologic events investigated over three years. So what about our 40-year-old man, uh, the man with a PT2N1A tumor, who's had a successful operation, but has that worrisome single uh, paratracheal metastatic lymph node. Um, the classical risk factors uh, that we have considered uh, in a predicting a patient's risk of recurrence and their potential benefit from the more vigilant monitoring permitted after remnant ablation have been their age, tumor size, extrathyroidal invasion, cervical metastases or extrathyroidal spread. And then of course, the aggressive histologic subtypes we know exist among patients with papillary thyroid cancer. These are the risk factors that are embedded in the American Thyroid Association's 2015 criteria. And those criteria of foreshadowed in a, a comment, although not a hard recommendation, uh, the potential role for genetic markers of aggressiveness. And let me, in 
the final few minutes we have together, uh, make the case for such tumor genotyping in decision-making in borderline cases like this 40-year-old man. This is a review uh, by uh, an important colleague of uh, Dr. Alzarani and mine, uh, Professor Mingxiao Xing, uh, in which he looked at two dozen studies that have examined in papillary cancers the odds ratio of lymph node metastases present at initial surgery based upon the presence or absence of BRAF mutation. And you can see here that uh, there is a twofold higher risk of such nodal metastases in the presence of a BRAF mutated tumor. Similarly, uh, there is an almost threefold greater risk of the tumor having extra thyroidal invasion. Uh, most importantly, you can see in this uh, study of 219 patients from four centers globally, followed for a decade after a primary treatment uh, for papillary thyroid cancer, that individuals whose tumors harbored a BRAF mutation, as opposed to those who did not, had a significantly higher rate of recurrence, with the y-axis here being recurrence-free probability. Now, the important thing about this observation is that p-value took into account all of the classical variables uh, that the American Thyroid Association guidelines and most of us in daily practice consider in making decisions about radioiodine therapy and other aggressive treatment and monitoring after surgery. And it was especially relevant in patients with stage one or two uh, papillary thyroid cancer, where a BRAF mutation alone was associated with a 12-fold higher risk of recurrence, suggesting that such a mutation, if known, could shine a light on the hidden risk that occasionally surprises us in an apparently low-risk uh, patient based on conventional clinical pathological features. And even more importantly, in this uh, 2015 uh, paper published by Dr. Shing, uh, you can see that BRAF mutation was associated with a, a lower of uh, survival probability after initial treatment. And so uh, in closing, as we return to the operational question in this 40-year-old man with the PT2N1A tumor, should he have remnant ablation? Uh, my approach in such patients uh, is shown in these three questions. Uh, I will ask, what is this patient's serum thyroglobulin going to be uh, three months from now when the thyroglobulin will have decayed to the steady state after surgery? Uh, what will this man's next ultrasound appearance be three months postoperatively? And then importantly, uh, what was uh, the BRAF status of his tumor uh, as assessed on the surgically resected tissue? Uh, the answers to these questions, I believe, can guide us to the right decision in such uh, borderline cases. I want to just close with this paper uh, published just last week in Thyroid, showing how uh, presumably uh, the ATA 2015 guidelines and thoughtful consideration of new factors in decision-making are having an impact on trends in management of localized papillary thyroid cancer. And here you see uh, using 18 SEER registries from 2000 to 2018, how Dr. Kitahara, Sosa, and Pasquale's group have seen a change in a physician behavior in the management of patients 
particularly uh, with lower risk papillary thyroid cancers in the subset on the left-hand side of this slide with tumors less than four centimeters. And how beginning about 2010, there has been a decrease in the performance of radioiodine therapy among uh, low-risk patients with no real change in those greater than four centimeters as would be appropriate. So when they examined papillary cancers less than four centimeters, including microcarcinomas, you can see that increasingly more had a total thyroidectomy alone. Uh, lobectomy declining initially up to 2006 and then rising again from 2015 to 18. Uh, the extent, interestingly, of non-surgical management, this uh, approach of vigilant monitoring of patients with papillary microcarcinomas uh, was rarely employed in the United States over this time frame in less than 1% of patients. And similar treatment trends, the omission of radioiodine therapy in low-risk patients were observed across the spectrum of gender, age, race, ethnicity, and hospital location. Well, I, uh, I, th I think our time uh, prevents us from focusing on additional issues uh, related to recombinant TSH and low-dose use. I just want to make one point about uh, recombinant TSH-mediated therapy, which is you can see that the blood dose in patients ablated with recombinant TSH in this subset of our pivotal trial of remnant ablation in recombinant TSH is only 30% of that in recombinant TSH versus a thyroid hormone withdrawn patients. That, of course, because of the decrease in cardiac output and renal plasma flow accompanying the hypothyroidism with thyroid hormone withdrawal. Uh, adding this to the list of reasons why recombinant TSH is really the preferred approach uh, where possible in radioiodine-treated patients, especially in light of this new data regarding secondary malignancies in patients with thyroid cancer uh, treated with radioiodine. There are other unanswered questions, uh, and hopefully the younger uh, clinicians and clinical sciences in the audience will think about addressing these questions about uh, how to determine the best administered dose and uh, in what patients recombinant TSH is absolutely essential, uh, the exciting issue of redifferentiating targeted chemotherapy. So in uh, conclusion, uh, Dr. al Jahani and Dr. al Zarani, for 80 years, radioiodines played key roles in thyroid cancer management, ablating remnant tissue, and in patient with iodine avid distant disease, treating that disease and identifying it. Guidelines that up until now have been based largely on retrospective data have defined the conditions where radioiodine use is appropriate, but their application has been uneven in practice, uh, certainly in the United States and I'll bet in the Arab world. Uh, we have a lingering concern about radioiodine causing secondary malignancies, underscoring the importance of making these decisions right. Tumor ge uh, genotyping may augment our classical clinical pathologic features in decision-making about borderline cases and recombinant TSH, uh, lower administered I-131 doses and a topic I haven't touched on, briefer low iodine diets have refined our clinical practice in these patients. Thank you very much for inviting me to contribute to your uh, meeting this evening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Leidenson. This was a wonderful lecture, bringing us uh, to the state of the art in the, in the issue of uh, 
I, I should say, on the, on the long-standing troubling issue of the use of radioactive iodine, its uh, consequences, and its use, especially in the low-risk um, patients, and the value of uh, uh, tumor genotyping in, uh, in, in some situations uh, to decide upon that. So I think this was a wonderful lecture. We'll take uh, questions later on uh, after the second lecture. Uh, and uh, please, for the audience, uh, please post your uh, questions in the Q&A um, uh, chat uh, area. So now we'll move to the second lecture uh, by Professor Brian Haugen. Uh, uh, Professor Haugen is a uh, professor of medicine and pathology at the University of Colorado, Denver, Colorado. He is the head of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism in the same institution and the chair of the Endocrine uh, Neoplasm Research Program. Uh, professor Haugen obtained his um, MD from Mayo School of Medicine, Rochester, Minnesota, and did his residency and fellowship at the University of Colorado Medical Center where he has been uh, leading actually the center for many years or the endocrine uh, division for many years. Uh, Dr. Haugen is a distinguished uh, international expert. Uh, he has many achievements among them. He was the past president of the American Thyroid Association. As Dr. Ladenson mentioned, he was the chair of the thyroid cancer guidelines uh, that was published in 2015. And, uh, became actually the standard of care for uh, uh, management of thyroid cancer around the world. Uh, Professor Haugen uh, is a recipient of several awards. Among them is the Paul Star Lecture Award in 2012 from the American Thyroid Association and the Sidney Engbar Distinguished Lectureship Award in 2019. Uh, his areas of interest include um, advanced thyroid cancer management, thyroid dysfunction, and other endocrine uh, uh, neoplasms. His lab studies uh, the, the molecular uh, uh, pathogenesis of thyroid uh, neoplasm, uh, diagnostic um, uh, methods, uh, pathophysiology, uh, tumor microenvironment, and immunotherapy. And today he is going to talk to us about management of advanced and aggressive thyroid cancer. Brian. Thank you very much, Dr. al -Zahrani. and thank you to both you and Dr. al Chahani for the invitation to speak with you. Um, and it's always uh, an honor for me to be speaking with Dr. Ladenson. Um, let me get my slides up, and then I think... We see your slides, Brian. Is that in the correct mode now? Uh, it is actually in the presenter's mode, so we see okay. two slides at the same time. How's that? Yeah, this is better now. So okay, it is. great. And and uh, as Dr. Al Zahrani said, uh, I'm going to be speaking to you about kind of the more aggressive side. So from what Dr. Ladenson talked about, um, I'll be talking about patients with much more aggressive uh, thyroid cancer, and I've entitled it also Entering the Golden Age of Advanced Thyroid Cancer Care. So again, thank you very much for having me um, speak with you. Um, the way I'd like to do this is, is start with a timeline. And, and from the, a U.S. perspective of FDA-approved drugs for thyroid cancer, I'll let you know that my disclosures include research support to my institution, not to me, um, for a study that I'll talk about uh, that was supported by Merck and ASI. So again, I'll do this in a timeline fashion. And, you know, we think back to what was the first FDA approved therapy for patients with thyroid cancer. And if you guessed radioiodine, that would be correct. It was FDA approved in 1971 for the treatment of thyroid cancer. Maybe a little tougher is what, what is the second therapy that was uh, approved for thyroid cancer, and that is doxorubicin. Actually, it was approved in 1974 on what I would call is some pretty soft evidence in the late 60s and early 70s of therapy both for anaplastic and for aggressive differentiated thyroid cancer. The reason why I show this timeline is really we hit what I guess I would call the therapeutic desert. Um, and I've had this in this slide before, so it's not specifically for this audience, but we've hit really a therapeutic desert um, uh, for a long period of time. And again, it began in the late 1970s for not having new therapies for advanced thyroid cancer. I put a red dot here in 1990. That's when I began treating patients with thyroid cancer. In 2000, we were still in this 
therapeutic desert in 2010, we were still in this therapeutic desert. It wasn't until 2013 when serafinib, one of the multi-kinase VEGF directed inhibitors was approved uh, for patients with advanced thyroid cancer that we had our next approved therapy. So really um, 40 years later. Uh, then quickly lenvatinib was approved uh, as another multi-kinase inhibitor. Then in 2017, and I, I'll talk about this a little bit in our research, but pembrolizumab was approved, not for thyroid cancer, but for any type of cancer that has microsatellite instability or deficiency of the mismatch repair genes, including thyroid cancers, any solid tumor. That's why I have it in a different color because it's not tumor specific. In 2018, dibrafenib and trametinib were approved for treatment of uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer with BRAF mutation, and I'll briefly show that study. Also, lerotrectinib, an NTRAC inhibitor, was approved again for solid tumors with an NTRAC uh, uh, fusion. Entrectinib was improved, another NTRAC inhibitor in 2019. And in 2020, selpercatinib and pralcetinib were approved in lung and thyroid cancers that had RET mutations or gene rearrangements. And again, I'll show a little bit of data on that. And finally, just last year, cabozantinib, and I have it in italics here because it was approved as a second line therapy um, after the other the VEGF inhibitors such as serafinib and lenvatinib, which are approved for first line therapy after patients progress on that. And I'll briefly mention that study as well. So you can see since 2013, there's been a tremendous um, amount of activity. So what I'll do is now I'll move on to what this would be as my summary slide, which I'll come back to is how do we approach these patients who have radioiodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer? So we have a patient who has differentiated thyroid cancer that's radioiodine refractory. And one of the first questions we ask is, do they have progressive disease, generally disease that grows over a certain amount, uh, usually that's 20% over six to 12 months, or do they have symptomatic disease? And if the answer to that is no, we can move into this active surveillance loop with TSH suppression as our chemotherapy, as I tell my patients, and then continually following these patients over various intervals. And if the answer continues to be no, we can monitor. And many of us have monitored these patients for decades, even patients with distant metastatic disease, generally small lung metastases. If in fact they do have progressive or symptomatic disease, I think the next question is, is how many lesions are we dealing with? If we have just a few lesions, we can consider directed therapy. And I won't talk too much about those. I'm gonna focus more on systemic therapies, but directed therapies are things like surgery, external beam radiotherapy, uh, 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 thermal ablation for these different um, types of tumors. And that really depends on the tumor and where it is. If in fact they have many lesions that are all progressing, a systemic progression, we need to consider systemic therapy. And again, in the US, what we do is we consider FDA approved therapies first, and you can see there's a number of them and we'll come back to the utility of uh, getting mutation status um, on these patients. And also a secondary consideration is adding bone directed therapy for patients with bone metastases. Um, and this is generally to try to uh, reduce skeletal related events such as pain, fracture, or nerve impingement. If they failed approved therapy, we consider entry into a clinical trial first. If a clinical trial is not available or appropriate for that patient, we cannot get them on a trial, we consider off-label. And I won't really talk about the off-label therapies, but there are a number of them that have made it through phase two trials. Uh, just giving one example of pazopinib is one of those types of therapies. It's not approved, but has had some trial experience in thyroid cancer. So this is my general approach when I'm seeing a patient with uh, advanced radioiodine refractory thyroid cancer. So sort of to understand the therapies and what we do, we need to understand a little bit more about sort of what makes the cancer grow and tick. And this is just a study, um, a, a review that I did with Steve Sherman back in 2013, published um, in Endocrine Reviews, looking at the thyroid follicular cell and progression to papillary carcinoma, uh, to a follicular adenoma and follicular carcinoma, um, on into advanced thyroid carcinoma, which can include still differentiated follicular or papillary, but is behaving aggressively or poorly differentiated. And then finally, to undifferentiated or anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. As we know, papillary carcinoma is the most predominant and has a really an excellent overall 10-year survival. A small subset of these people go on to have very aggressive disease that need other treatments. 
Um, follicular thyroid carcinoma, depending upon if you're in an iodine deficient or sufficient area, can be higher or lower as far as prevalence. And it does have a lower 10-year survival, partly because of these patients with vascular invasion, um, but still overall a good 10-year survival rate. The patients with the more progressive papillary or follicular carcinoma, some of the herthal cell carcinomas and poorly differentiated thyroid cancers have a poorer 10-year survival rate, still about 50% in the number of these, in general, in these patients. And of course, our patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer have a very poor uh, survival and need aggressive uh, therapy. Another way to look at this, and this was a nice review last year in Frontiers in Endocrinology by Mark Zaffareo and colleagues from MD Anderson, um, is to say, okay, what, what, is, what are the drivers and pathways in these tumors? And this in the center here is the cancer cell. And then you have some sort of these supporting microenvironment cells, such as on the right, the endothelial cell, and on the left, the T lymphocyte representing uh, the broader immune uh, background here. And what we can see is there are these extracellular receptors and then internal signaling. And there are two main pathways, the RAS BRAF MEK or MAP kinase pathway and the RAS PI3 kinase AKT mTOR or what's called the PI3 kinase pathway. And both of these pathways are important as thyroid cancers progress. Um, we can also see the iodine uh, symporter here and we know that if you activate the MAP kinase pathway, you decrease this activity and um, uh, uh, relocation of the sodium iodide symporter. So we have uh, more resistance to radioiodine in these people with things like BRAF mutations. But if we look at all these possible therapies, they can be directed at these extracellular receptors. They can be directed at these internal pathways. Um, and so there's a number of ways we can do this. What I'd like to start with is obviously the two first approved drugs, lenvatinib and serafinib, that are what are called multi-kinase inhibitors. Primarily, they hit the VEGF receptor on the endothelial cell and on the tumor cell, um, but they also have some other uh, uh, sites that they hit, such as the platelet-derived growth factor receptor, um, the fibroblast growth factor receptor, so they're multi-kinase um, uh, inhibitors. And I just want to show you something that I think everyone has seen, is this was the uh, trial in um, 2016 called the SELECT trial led by Martin Schlumberger and Steve Sherman showing the really tremendous uh, effect of lenvatinib on, on progression-free survival. And this was a two-to-one randomization um, of 261 patients. And this is one of the most impressive spreads I've seen between active therapy and placebo, progression-free survival improving from 3.6 to 18 months. Uh, so this is really a very impressive therapy. Also, the partial response rate was very high, meaning tumor shrinkage by 30% or more. However, the complete response and what we would consider cures still is very low with this therapy. And we need to think about other therapies to pair this with in rational combination therapies to improve complete, uh, complete response rates and overall long-term survival and even cures in some patients. So related to that, I wanna just divert a little bit and show you a, a clinical trial that we've been part of. And I've done a lot of this work with my colleague, Dr. Jenna French, who's a PhD tumor immunologist at the University of Colorado. And we've been very interested in immune therapies and these checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and the concept of this, for those who don't study it that carefully, is we have an activated T cell when it basically can uh, ligate and it's the co-stimulatory molecules, it becomes activated and it turns on these checkpoints. And two of them here, there's many of them, but two of them here are program death one or PD-1 and CTLA-4, and I'll really focus on a PD-1. And then if we have the PD-1 ligand, we can activate this um, pathway. And then basically we negatively modulate this T cell. So once it's done its work, cleaning up an infection or something like that, it gets turned off so we don't have autoimmune disease and rampant um, uh, 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 autoimmunity. But what tumors can do is basically take advantage of this and turn on this pathway. So we basically have exhausted T cells that are no longer functional. They're there in the microenvironment, but they're no longer functional. And these therapies, which are antibody therapies against PD-1, PD-L1, and against CTLA-4, can break this exhaustion and basically reactivate this cell. And the, some of the best work, it's in many different types of tumors, but has been in melanoma. We've had some very impressive responses 
in patients with melanoma who've been treated with these drugs. The other thing that was interesting to us, and this is, there have been a number of studies, this is just one, um, a study out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, patients treated with non-small cell lung cancer, and if they looked, a subset of them got thyroid dysfunction, autoimmune thyroid dysfunction, which is a side effect of this, and actually relatively common with the PD-1 uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors. But if they looked at the overall survival in these lung cancer patients, the ones who had thyroid dysfunction did much better sort of a surrogate saying maybe they had a very good response to breaking that tolerance, um, at not only to the tumor, but then again, now against the thyroid causing autoimmune thyroid disease. So what we thought about was maybe that could also break this tolerance in patients with uh, differentiated thyroid cancer that's more aggressive. So again, the simple actors we have here are the cancer cell itself that does express this PD-1 ligand. And then what we have is our uh, CD4 T cell help T helper cells and CD8 cytotoxic T cells. And then the T regulatory cells that actually, if they ligand, they can secrete suppressive cytokines into the microenvironment to make it um, so that again, it's a more dysfunctional and cannot clear the tumor. So if we use a PD-1 or PDL one antibody to block this, we can block this. And then a VEGF directed multikinase such as lenvatinib we can basically uh, directly treat the tumor and in some cases also affect the T regulatory cells, which we and others have shown are very prevalent in the microenvironment, especially in the lymph nodes of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer. So we thought this would be a good drug combination therapy. So we, we've been doing a lot of preclinical work, but I just want to show you the updated results of a, of a clinical trial, a phase two clinical trial that we led. Uh, Dr. French and I led together with Dr. Lori Wirth uh, at Mass General Hospital and our site PI, Dr. Dan Bowles, my medical oncologist at the University of Colorado. And we, we had um, uh, seven centers that were involved in this study through the International Thyroid Oncology Group. Patients had to have progressive disease and cohort one was lenvatinib naive. So they'd not seen lenvatinib or any other multikinase inhibitor. And they were treated with lenvatinib starting at 20 milligrams and then pembrolizumab, Keytruda, every three weeks, IV, 200 milligrams, standard dose. Cohort two is not a direct comparison. This is an interesting separate group in patients who have progressed on lenvatinib. They're tolerating the drug, but the tumor has now grown. And can we add back pembrolizumab, not stopping the lenvatinib? Um, and this is a common thing in oncology is to not just stop the medicine that they're progressing through, but add another medication. So these are the two different cohorts. We had 30 patients in cohort one. Our primary endpoint was complete response because partial response um, was, uh, as you knew, with single agent uh, uh, lenvatinib is 63%. And then in cohort two, it was overall response rate since these were patients progressing on lenvatinib. This is just some basic demographics in the two groups. You can see there are more men in cohort two compared to cohort one. There's more even distribution of males and females. Obviously prior systemic VEGF directed therapy, you couldn't get in cohort one. Most of the patients had had therapy even before lenvatinib in cohort two. So these are patients who've been treating, treated with a lot of medications. And the one other thing I'd like to point out, I, I still find fascinating and we'll dig into a little bit further is um, liver metastases are very uncommon. And in cohort one, none of the patients have liver metastases. Interestingly, in cohort two, those who progressed on lenvatinib, a third of them had liver metastases. I don't know if it's that patients with liver metastases get resistant to lenvatinib, or once you're on lenvatinib, it's stressing that you maybe have an increase in liver metastases, but it was an interesting finding that we had. So this shows a standard waterfall plot, and this is again patients in cohort one naive to lenvatinib, and you can see there's a, overall a very good response to these individual patients, and this is the 30% uh, shrinkage line of partial response, and that's what we see in the green here. Unfortunately, we did not see any complete responses. That's what we were looking for uh, in this uh, cohort. If you compare it to the SELECT trial, um, as far as complete partial response, stable disease, or progressive disease, it really looked pretty similar to lenvatinib alone. Um, so we don't know, and there was no direct comparison group here to say, is this much better than lenvatinib alone? 
If we look at our overall progression-free survival, it was quite good with a near 80% 12-month progression-free survival and a 63% 18-month progression-free survival. Again, if you compare that to the SELECT trial, these are the different time points in the SELECT trial. They are below this, but is it statistically significant or clinically significant? I don't know if this gives us a bit longer progression-free survival. And then finally, what we looked at was what's called a swim lane plot. These again are individual patients, and this is time on months on treatment on the bottom. And each individual patient here, you can see the type of tumor is color coded. The ones that have arrows up top here, we're still on treatment two years into, into this. So we have a number of patients who really had tremendous benefits. It doesn't seem to be predicted by the type of tumor they had, herthal, poorly differentiated versus papillary or follicular. They're fairly evenly distributed, but there also are some patients who had very poor responses, rapidly progressed through this. And we're trying to do some correlative science research to try to understand the differences between these groups. And maybe we can tailor this to individual patients based on their immune phenotype or based on their mutation status. And then just to let you know that um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bruna Bertol, working with Dr. Jenna French, had recently published a paper in thyroid using an animal model. And we're trying to, again, dissect these out, treating them with lenvatinib and a PD-1 inhibitor in an animal model to have that help complement the uh, human studies. So what about those folks in cohort two? So this group, again, if you look at it, these are people who were progressing on lenvatinib. We had a lot of stable disease, only one patient who had progressive disease as their best response. And we did have a handful, 15% of partial responses. So I do think there is something going on in people who are breaking through lenvatinib and we add pembrolizumab. The thing I'd like to bring to your attention and last year was published by Marsha Brose and colleagues was this uh, trial called Cosmic 311 that was looking at a cabozantinib in patients who'd progressed on previous. They could have up to two multikinase inhibitor therapies, usually serafinib or lenvatinib. And then that was stopped and they were put on cabozantinib that has a slightly different profile. And their overall um, was not a great response in the sense of a complete response or partial response, but there was a lot of stable disease and actually a pretty good um, uh, 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 progression-free survival. So that's how this got approved as second-line therapy in people who've progressed on drugs like lenvatinib or serafinib. Um, maybe there is a bit deeper response if we add pembrolizumab to these patients. Um, but when we look at progression-free survival and we just, again, generally compare it to that cabozantinib trial, we didn't see a much better progression-free survival by adding pembrolizumab. So in the future, you may consider, do I switch, stop, and switch to cabozantinib, or do I add pembrolizumab into a patient like this? If we look again at this swim plot, we see, again, these tremendous responders who are still on therapy. Some of these, and the top one here was a herthal cell tumor. So we thought maybe herthal cell tumors are going to really respond by adding pembrolizumab. But you can see three patients with herthal cell tumors down here that really had pretty fairly short responses, only seven months before they progressed um, on this. So we still need to do work to try to dissect out who are these people who are having really durable responses versus the ones who really progress rapidly. And if we can do that, I think we can better tailor uh, this future therapy for these patients. All right, so in the last uh, maybe five uh, or six minutes that I have, what I'd like to do is come back to other therapies. So we focused on sort of these uh, extracellular receptors. Um, and I, what I'd like to focus on is two others, the RET receptor and the NTRAC receptor. We talked about pembrolizumab already. And then to talk about some of these um, internal, cell internal pathways, such as the MAP kinase pathway and therapies uh, for these. Where are we now with this? And this was a study that, that uh, was led by uh, Nikita Posdeyev in our group. And again, one of the senior authors together with me was Dr. Dan Bowles, our medical oncologist. And we really uh, had a relationship with Foundation Medicine and they gave us a large sample of their patients who'd been um, tested, who had very advanced disease. And so we got that together with some data from Memorial Sloan Kettering, over 770 patients. And if you look at advanced papillary thyroid cancer, large number of tumors, no, no uh, uh, 
shock to people here, most of these were BRAF mutations. But there were a number who had RAS mutations, actually a significant minority who had RET rearrangements. And then there was a small but significant number of patients who had either NTRAC um, uh, fusions, ALK fusions, or this mismatch repair gene defect. If we look at our nearly 200 anaplastic thyroid cancer patients, definitely BRAF was involved here, but in less than half. RAS was a quarter. RET was very uncommon, but still, again, seen in a few. NTRAC was 2%. The ALK fusion uh, was in less than 1%. And again, a little bit higher in these patients who have mismatch repair defects or microsatellite instability. Why is that important? Because we can tailor our drugs to these mutations. And this is what we do in these patients with advanced disease is at least, at the very least, get this profile or do broader genetic testing on these tumors because we can consider these different therapies um, for these patients. Some are FDA approved, some are not at this point. And what we do at the University of Colorado is do mutation testing where we can get a rapid within 24 hours uh, bead on the BRAF mutation status very helpful for our anaplastic patients if we wanna consider combination BRAF and MEK inhibitor. And then if it's BRAF wild type, we look at these other, um, uh, cause usually these are mutually exclusive um, in these patients. So this was the study that got approval for anaplastic thyroid cancer, which was interesting. It was 16 patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer out of a bigger cohort, but this impressive waterfall plot of patients who had really deep responses of stable disease, but really a, a partial response, great shrinkage, and one patient ended up having a complete response to the combination of dibrafenib and trametinib. And again, if we look at the uh, swimmer plot, we can see out to um, nearly two years, some of these patients were benefiting from this therapy. Patients do progress, and so we need to think about moving them on to other therapies, and there's now some trials going on combining this with immune therapies as well in patients with these advanced cancer. But this was the study that got this approved um, in the United States for upfront therapy in patients with BRAF-mutated anaplastic thyroid cancer. There are also some studies looking at this in differentiated thyroid cancer, and what I'll say is we see um, some mixed benefit. This is with uh, vemurafenib, a BRAF inhibitor alone, uh, that was a phase two open label study with 51 patients. Um, and we do, again, see some benefit, but this is not nearly as, as a big of a hit, I think, as we've seen with um, anaplastic thyroid cancer. So this is yet not an indication in patients with differentiated thyroid cancer. We can see there are no complete responses, modest partial response, but there is some stable disease um, with these patients. There had also been uh, another study by Dr. Manisha Shaw looking at dibrafenib plus um, a trametinib versus dibrafenib. And actually they were fairly similar progression-free survival. So I don't know if you need combination therapy in these patients. And the one caveat I'll give is presented at last year's International Thyroid Oncology Group meeting, Dr. Alan Ho and his colleagues looked at a series of patients who had either RAS or BRAF mutations with differentiated thyroid cancer. And the patients who had RAS mutations and got a MEK inhibitor alone, I think it was one out of 35 patients had a recurrence that was anaplastic thyroid cancer. But the patients who had BRAF mutations who were treated with dibrafenib plus trametinib, five out of 16 eventually had progression with anaplastic thyroid cancer. Now, was that related to the therapy or would that have happened anyway? We don't know, but that is a cautionary tale of using these therapies in patients with BRAF uh, mutations. That said, if we have patients with rapidly progressive differentiated thyroid cancer that we don't have other therapies for, we do consider this. So RET has been approved, again, for these therapies. And this was led by Dr. Lori Wirth and colleagues and published in 2020. And this is what got selpercatinib approved for this. I'm showing you the patients with medullary thyroid cancer who have RET mutations. Again, a very impressive and durable response um, in these patients. There's even been anecdotal responses of some patients who've had um, undetectable uh, calcitonins and they've had to stop the therapy for other reasons and the calcitonin had not risen. So we really need to see in these patients who appear to have a complete response if we can stop the drug at some point. There was a smaller subset of patients with poorly differentiated or um, differentiated or herthal cell cancer and a few anaplastics. And again, fairly good response um, in these patients. So this is now approved in the US for patients with this disease. Complete response was 5%, partial response was 74%. 
This is a twice a day drug, fairly well tolerated. Um, these people can have liver ab uh, enzyme abnormalities is one of the most uh, prominent uh, problems that they have. Um, this is now Lero. Yeah, I didn't show procetinib here. Uh, this is lerotrectinib. Um, this is the NTRAC inhibitor and uh, our uh, investigators participated in this trial, again, in patients who have NTRAC fusions, very impressive responses. The light green you'll see here are five patients who had uh, differentiated thyroid cancer uh, in this. And you can see there's uh, all these patients had at least a partial response uh, to therapy. So this is a good reason to get NTRAC fusion testing. And if they're positive, this is a very good therapy, very well tolerated. Complete response in this group, again, a mixed group of tumors with 16% with a partial response of 64%. And then finally, I just wanna talk about redifferentiation because I think this is a new era that we're coming into and we're trying to figure out who are these patients that we should be trying this on. This is the trial that I think many of you know, led by Alan Ho and Jim Fagan out of Memorial Sloan Kettering looking at um, selumetinib, which is not the strongest MEK inhibitor, but this was a, a, one of the first of its kind studies looking at I-124 PET. And they basically showed before treatment with selumetinib and after treatment, they really had increased radioiodine uptake in these tumors. And these patients actually had some pretty good responses uh, to this therapy. Um, the durability still is a bit of a question here, but this is, uh, again, something that we tend to do with some of these therapies is if we put a patient on it anyway, and if we see some tumor shrinkage at a certain point in time, we may check an I-123 whole body scan to see if they could benefit from additional uh, radioiodine based on this. This is another study looking again at the MAP kinase pathway uh, using either a MEK inhibitor or a BRAF and MEK inhibitor. Again, showing individual cases where they definitely had significant um, uptake uh, after treatment. And this is um, sort of the, uh, what's called the sum of target lesions is what SOT is here. And you'll see some patients, two patients here had a dramatic response. A few patients had an early response, but again, the tumors grew. So I think we have to figure out who to treat, how big should the tumors be, things like that to say who is going to benefit possibly from this redifferentiation therapy and additional radioiodine. This shows lerotrectinib, the NTRAC inhibitor, in one patient out of France that again had no uptake in their lungs, but after lerotrectinib had pretty impressive diffuse uptake in their lungs. And this again shows in the, um, uh, in the uh, CT uh, fusion. So again, I'll come to my conclusion here. This is where I started in how we approach these patients. Um, and uh, the, the future here, I think, is in redifferentiation therapy with these kinase inhibitors and possibly other therapies, including epigenetic therapy, something I didn't get to talk about, but neoadjuvant therapy. There's some data in both differentiated and anaplastic thyroid cancer that treating patients before surgery when they're not surgically resectable, and many of them can shrink and they can become surgically resectable, and obviously novel combination therapies to see if we can get actual cures uh, for these patients. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, and uh, again, thank you for having me join you in this uh, great meeting. Thank you very much, Dr. Haugen, uh, for this excellent presentation, bringing us to the state of the art in this uh, fascinating and evolving uh, field of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, immunotherapy, and many other uh, aspects of um, uh, therapy of aggressive thyroid cancer. Uh, we, I was planning actually to do Q&A now, but I think we'll make it after the case presentations. I don't see many questions. I have some myself, but I will uh, we'll leave it un until the end of the case presentation. So we'll move. Uh, we have two cases, complicated and, and uh, relatively straightforward. And I uh, will uh, uh, get uh, the opinion of our experts here on those cases. So the first case is going to be presented by Dr. Uh, Shada Samarkandi. Dr. Samarkandi is a consultant endocrinologist and assistant professor at King uh, Abdelaziz University Hospital. She's dealing with a lot of patients in the western region of the country. And I have always enjoyed uh, uh, discussion with her and um, uh, uh, sharing uh, uh, care of some patients uh, together. And today she is going to present some of the difficult cases. So, uh, uh, Dr. Samarkandi, please proceed. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everybody. Can you uh, see my slides? We can see your slide, but your 
voice is a bit uh, on the low side. Okay, so we'll see what we can do about that. So um, thank you, Dr. Zahrani, for the kind introduction. I will be uh, sharing with you one of my challenging cases. Uh, so he's a 60 year old gentleman transferred to King Abdelaziz University Hospital in early 2021 from a community hospital following an incomplete surgery for an invasive papillary thyroid carcinoma. So we did the CT chest uh, on him and it showed residual lift paratracheal mass invading the lift cricoid cartilage with extension to the adjacent strap muscles, measuring 1.8 centimeters along with multiple and large necrotic left cervical diastinal nodes, largest is in the left level four, measuring 5.2 centimeters. The air digestive tract structures, the major vessels were pushed but not invaded or encased by the tumor. Uh, the patient did not have suspicious osseous lesions at that time. CT chest showed multiple bilateral lung nodules. The largest is four millimeter, suspicious for metastasis. So what we did is uh, a path review on his slides from his original center, and it showed papillary thyroid carcinoma, tall cell variant, eight centimeters, with extensive vascular and perineural invasion and invasion into the strap muscles. By exam, his vocal cords were mobile bilaterally. So he underwent in our center a revision thyroidectomy and bilateral central and lateral lymph node uh, dissection and the path review for that surgery was the same, papillary thyroid carcinoma, tulsa variant, and 22 out of 88 positive large uh, lymph nodes, the largest is four centimeters with external extension. So postoperatively, his suppressed thyroglobulin came back as 771 with negative uh, thyroglobulin antibodies. And at that time, we sent him back to his center for radioactive uh, iodine. Samarkandi, let's get the opinion uh, and, and also to summarize the case uh, at this point and get the opinion of uh, Dr. Leidenson and Dr. Haugen. So could you just make a little summary of this case? So he's a 60-year-old gentleman with a history of uh, invasive ability to also variant thyroid cancer with involvement of lymph node and also had uh, lung metastasis at the time of the presentation. Very good. Dr. Leidenson, what would you do with this patient at this stage? Well, I certainly endorse the approach that uh, was taken at the uh, referred hospital, which is to undertake um, more complete surgery. Uh, this is going to be the most important aspect of the patient's primary therapy. And uh, after careful assessment of his vocal cord function, it's uh, good to hear that it was possible to more completely resect the primary tumor. Um, I also think it's reasonable to now be considering radioiodine therapy, although I think we all appreciate that radioiodine is unlikely uh, to prove very helpful to this patient in the long term. Uh, nonetheless, using radioiodine will uh, take out of the equation any element of thyroglobulin persistence that may be contributed to by remnant normal thyroid tissue. And it will take off the table the remote possibility that this is a, a tall cell variant papillary cancer that does concentrate radioiodine. Uh, we know that 75% of tall cell variant papillary cancers have a V600E BRAF mutation. And we know that uh, part of the consequences of MAP kinase pathway activation uh, as a result of an activating BRAF mutation, as Dr. Haugen represented, is a down regulation of the complement of genes that represent iodine concentrating uh, uh, capability. So a down regulation of the TSH receptor, the sodium iodide supporter, thyroglobulin, thyroid peroxidase. So even though it's most unlikely radioiodine therapy is 
going to be the solution to this man's residual disease, I think it is an appropriate next step for the reasons that I've just recommended. Thank you, Dr. Leiden. So let's move uh, uh, to Dr. Samarkandi and see what happened. So actually, while the patient was uh, uh, prepared for radioactive iodine, he presented three months following the surgery to our emergency department with Strider. And at that time, an uh, emergency tracheostomy was placed. And as you can see, he, uh, while he was prepared for radioactive iodine, he was in uh, thyroxin withdrawal protocol. His TSH was 139 and his thyroglobulin was more than uh, 13,000. So a CT neck at that time showed a large left um, mass uh, measuring 4.8 centimeters in the largest diameter per tracheal with transglottic involvement and invasion of the inferior aspect of the thyroid cartilage and extra laryngeal extension with progression of the cricoid uh, cartilage involvement bilaterally and extension at the level of the true vocal cord to the contralateral transglottis. You can see here from the CT scan, the uh, large mass. So, and also the there was a new uh, manubrium sternae metastatic deposit measuring at 2.4 centimeters and a posterior four, uh, T4 vertebral body mass uh, metastatic lesion encroaching on, onto the uh, central spinal canal, as you can see at the arrow. So um, you can see here also from the MRI images, the, um, the T4 uh, lesion over here, uh, causing almost a uh, port compression. The, uh, he also had additional lesions at T9 and L2, but he did not have any neurological deficits at that time. So we, at the time that we performed the tracheostomy, he had uh, a neck mass core biopsy and it came back again with a thyroid cancer well differentiated. And we performed a rapid BRAF testing that came back positive for BRAF B600E. So Dr. Haugen, uh, uh, I think you, you now uh, see the, the full picture. We were only seeing the tip of the iceberg a while ago. Uh, what do you think we should do at this stage? Well, I, I think, um, you know, taking a step back, this is a good example of a patient where if possible, obviously at the very beginning, that first surgery, if there's some way that a consultation now, especially with our uh, ability to do things more remotely with a team, you know, because I think someone from the first surgery may have looked and said, this is not going to be able to be a good first surgery. Uh, the thing after the second surgery, I would have asked the surgeon, and I was kind of wondering about is, with that lesion that was invading in the cricoid, were they able to get what they felt was a complete resection? Because sometimes they'll have to shave it off, or sometimes they have to do a resection of actually that tissue, the cricoid or the trachea, uh, to try to get a complete resection. So was this an R0, meaning the surgeon got it all and the pathologist said they got it all, R1, the surgeon felt they got it all, but the pathologist said there were some positive margins, or an R2, where the surgeon said I couldn't get it all. Because depending upon that, what I would have done right after that is probably recommended external beam radiotherapy to try to control that. Because as Dr. Ladenson said, I mean, now that this patient has a disease that's going to give them trouble in a number of areas, including the spine, probably the lungs aren't such a problem right now. But this, the neck disease is gonna is is the major problem, and now it becomes much more difficult. How much role the TSH stimulation played in that rapid growth? I'm impressed that this was still a well differentiated papillary thyroid cancer on biopsy, and that probably is what the spine lesion is as well. Um, so for, from this point forward, um, obviously I talk with my surgeons. I take it that this is probably not resectable. Um, Definitely would obviously suppress the patient's TSH, probably consider some directed therapy at that spine lesion to control that from um, causing trouble. And we would consider either some form of systemic therapy or, um, or directed therapy to try to control that neck disease as well. So I would try to figure out how we best can control the uh, really uh, uh, rapidly growing disease that I hope is reversible when thyroid hormone is, to some degree, when thyroid hormone is put back on. Would you, would you uh, or Dr. Leidenson agree that this patient has really very advanced disease? And I'm not sure if 
if external radiation would have changed the course too much, uh, although it is logical to give it uh, after surgery, uh, this patient probably had already metastasis, distant metastasis from the beginning, from at the time of the initial surgery. Dr. Leidenson, you have uh, uh, any comment? Uh, well, I would just underscore <clears throat> the points that both Dr. Haugen and I have made <clears throat> about the importance of the initial surgery. Um, uh, although he does have distant metastases, this is a patient whose life is now endangered by virtue of his neck disease. And, uh, uh, you know, once one is forced, as I would agree with Dr. Haugen, one is now to consider external beam radiotherapy, surgical, subsequent surgical intervention is going to be even more difficult. I'd also like to elaborate a little bit on a, a point that Brian made about uh, the risks of recombinant TSH preparation in this setting. It sounds like the patient's uh, disease progressed to you know, bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve involvement before recombinant TSH. But in the presence of significant residual disease with DTC, uh, it has been well described by Dr. Ringel, Cooper, and others that you can have acute airway obstruction after recombinant TSH and uh, acute spinal uh, cord compression. So if one had ever reached the stage where one was preparing to use thyrogen mediation for radioiodine, this is clearly a patient who should have been under uh, glucocorticoid uh, coverage. I believe uh, this patient had thyroid hormone withdrawal, though. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. This we, was yeah. Yeah. And we have known for a long time that, uh, you know, the prolonged TSH stimulation associated with withdrawal can do this, the same thing. So, uh, so uh, the case now is in front of us with all the things that were mentioned. Uh, what would you recommend Dr. Haugen at this time? Yeah, well, I, 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 I assume the patient's back on thyroid hormone therapy. That's the first thing I would do. And, and you could get some benefit from that. I mean, you need to obviously you have the airway protected now. Uh, so hopefully you do have a little bit of time, but it seems like also there could be neurologic complications. So I clearly, I, I would uh, consider external beam radiotherapy. You could consider thermal ablation of that spine lesion, but I would directly treat that spinal lesion right now. Um, since the airway is somewhat protected, you do maybe have a little more time to see how the patient responds on thyroid hormone. You know, could you consider dibrafenib plus trametinib? This would be off-label in a patient like this. This would not be a direct uh, uh, indication for this, but I, the size of that lesion the way it is now, I would worry about external beam is going to be hard to really control that tumor, and also it's going to cause a lot of side effects um, for this patient. So I would probably treat the spine lesion um, and see how this patient does on thyroid hormone therapy. And I would, this is one of those patients where I would, if it doesn't shrink pretty rapidly on thyroid hormone, I would consider either external beam or dibrafenib plus trametinib therapy. Sure. Dr. Leidenson, would you consider uh, neck surgery again or a spinal uh, uh, canal surgery or a spinal surgery? Well, uh, Clearly, uh, spinal decompression surgery may be required uh, and, and may well be advisable before the initiation of, of external beam radiotherapy. Um, also, I think as endocrinologists, we are perhaps more gun shy than we should be about radical surgery in a patient like this. I, you know, this is a man who you know, probably needs a total laryngectomy. And uh, that may, you know, be his only hope with subsequent adjuvant external beam radiotherapy of prolonged survival. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Haugen about uh, his concerns about the risks of various chemotherapeutic options in the setting of violated upper airway structures like this. Yeah, no, that's a very good point, Paul, in that 
there, I think, is where I would be much more uh, hesitant to consider something like lenvatinib or serafinib because of the VEGF. And this is where you would lean more toward a very directed therapy that doesn't affect the vasculature as much, um, whether it be the RET, the Entrax, or in this case, uh, you know, either dibrafenib alone or dibrafenib plus trametinib. But I agree with you, Paul, that, that um, I always get surgical consultations on these immediately to say, what can you do to help? Uh, especially if there is neurologic deficits uh, as far as decompression. I just wouldn't send a patient like this to surgery to take care of a lesion if it's not causing neurologic symptoms at this point because you, you have many other lesions. But I agree too that, 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 that what may save this patient's life for a period of time, and we have a number of these folks um, who have had laryngectomies and actually can live for a fairly long time um, after a laryngectomy. Uh, so let's see what happened. Uh, Dr. Samarpandi, uh, tell us what, you, what did you do? So we actually went ahead with the spine surgery and we did a T2 to T7 transpedicular screw fixation and a T4 to T5 tumor decompression as we felt that the patient is going to have a, a cord compression at any minute. So at that time, we yeah. elected to uh, save his limbs. And uh, we booked him then for... Uh, total laryngectomy and tumor uh, debulking following uh, the uh, spine surgery. So at the time of the next surgery, the actually the surgeon called me and told me that the patient is inoperable, not even with a total laryngectomy. Okay, so now we have secured his uh, spinal cord to some extent. Uh, but we have a real issue with his neck disease and uh, the expert surgeons are saying that this is inoperable. So I think now we have to look into our, uh, our uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, available uh, options for this patient. Uh, Dr. Haugen? Yeah, our uh, options are getting our options are getting more and more limited <laughs> in a patient Absolutely. like this. Um, you know, I, I I suspect, but I always ask the surgeons because you know, like most surgeons will say, I can definitely operate. I, I suspect that this is inoperable because there's just too much of the airway they have to remove, and they couldn't, you know, or in some cases they'll do it because the esophagus is too much involved, and they cannot sort of reconnect. Uh, important structures appropriately, which is, I, I suspect that's why they're calling this in, inoperable um, in this patient. Uh, but again, palliative external beam radiotherapy is always, can always be considered in here. Uh, you know, cytotoxic chemotherapy and, and uh, taxane-based therapy can be considered, but boy, the responses are not great in a patient like this. So I still, if, if we wanted to try to do everything we could for this patient, I would consider a targeted therapy against BRAF in a patient like this. Dr. Leidenson, you have additional comment? Well, uh, I may have missed it, but it, it uh, is not clear to me yet whether this patient had a tracheostomy. And I think important considerations here uh, regardless of how one is going to proceed, include uh, uh, establishing a safe airway with a tracheostomy and also uh, a peg for this patient. Uh, because as the weeks go by, his nutrition is obviously going to be impaired and that in turn is going to make it more difficult for him to tolerate and and recover from whatever interventions one has in mind. It's going to make him more comfortable too if uh, he inexorably declines. So he had tracheostomy in place okay. um, and he is uh, swallowing, I think, fairly well, isn't it, uh, Shada? So to answer the, um, the race questions, the um... The esophagus and the pharynx were not involved or by the tumor. And regarding the question of the first surgery, the one that was the performed in our center, there was no gross disease left at that time. Um, I think I answered all the questions. So, so let's I proceed and see what, what did you do? Okay. So we actually went with the path of new adjuvant lymphopenic therapy. 
So after his uh, surgical wounds healed, we gradually started the development therapy starting from 10 to 13 to 24 milligrams over the course of 10 days. The patient tolerated the drug very well with the exception of mild hypertension. He continued on monthly zolidronic acid for his uh, skeletal diseases and he had external beam radiation therapy to his back from T1 to T5 vertebrae. We did not give him any external beam radiation therapy to the neck at that stage. So the course of treatment, so to understand the the time, the time frame here. So he started in Vatnab on October 27th uh, last year till the current date. And from February 10 till March 9, um, due to supply issue, he was not on the Vatnab. So from February 10 to 19 was uh, off uh, therapy. And from February 20 to March 10, 9, I switched him to Serafin at 400 milligrams uh, BID. And then uh, he, was, he um, is back again to Lumbatin at 24 milligrams. So um, this is his uh, wound uh, on the 27th of October, the, the day we started the lymphatinib therapy. And as you can see, the tumor was fungating from his um, sternum the, at the site that he had the skeletal metastases. And here on three months, uh, almost two, two, this uh, two months later, you can see that the tumor has regressed significantly. And from 29th, this is the CT that was performed before the, um, we started the lymphatinib therapy on the 29th of uh, September. And as you can see, the craniocodal uh, di diameter of the tumor from 3.47 till January over here, it's shrunk from uh, 3.47 to 2.77 and here from 2.54 to 2.36. And we performed an MRI in January this year, and it showed response to treatment in T9 to, T, to L2 with no new lesions. Uh, CT brain, we, uh, we performed it to make sure that there was no brain metastasis and the patient did not have. And repeated CTs in March this year, so only like a couple of weeks ago, the CT lung showed no lung nodules. Remember at the time of his presentation, he had small, the largest was four millimeters lung nodules. The CT next showed uh, stability in comparison to January. So at that uh, time, the examination, the last time that uh, his vocal cords were mobile bilaterally, but the transglottic area is almost blocked. So um, this is his CTs from uh, September till March. And uh, as you can see, there's this, in a slight reduction also in the, uh, the diameter of the tumor. So, and at that time we did discussed if he was ready for um, a surgery and we thought that he will not have a, the best surgery and probably we will just continue on lymphatinib hoping for the tumor to shrink even more. And due to the stationary course of his uh, tumor and that the possibility we might operate in the future, uh, the red off was did not advocate for extended beam radiation therapy at that time to the neck. And here is the uh, suppressed thyroglobulin for this patient. So this is before uh, lymphatinib therapy. So it was 1,553, and then uh, you can see a nicely drop in. Uh, thyroglobulin levels to 199, 92, and 62. And this is the period that he was um, off therapy for a short period and switched to serafin and then uh, a little of uh, in, an increment of 196. So this is my case. And, um, Thank you so much, Dr. Samar Gandhi. We'll take final uh, uh, thoughts from uh, Dr. Ladenson and then Dr. Haugen. Well, I would just say congratulations on uh, what you've done to palliate this man's disease. He's, he's been fortunate to have a really better than expected, than I would have expected response to Linvatnib. And I, th I think the difficult decisions you've made have all fallen in his favor. Great. Uh, Dr. Haugen? Yeah, no, I would agree. Uh, you know, really good work. Um, definitely, you know, we do consider patients for lenvatinib since actually it's approved for this type of 
uh, treatment. I think the big caution is someone with a tracheostomy in place and definitely someone with tumor that's involving lumens and or near vessels, we've seen some catastrophic bleeding. Now that said, if, even if you have fistulas, you know, surgeons can sometimes take care of the fistulas as well. So I, I think this was a, a good choice so far, a good outcome. I'm also impressed. This is one of the rare patients who's tolerating 24 milligrams of lenvatinib. We rarely see that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, actually, we have exceeded our time. I have a case, a much simpler case. Uh, if you would uh, give me another 10 to 15 minutes of your time, we can go over it. If you're uh, uh, busy with another uh, commitment, we can stop here. Uh, I would enjoy going ahead. Dr. Haugen, wonderful, sure. thank you. And uh, uh, okay, I appreciate that very much. Okay, so let's take the last uh, case. Uh, I'm going to share my slides. And actually, I like always to inform the audience. So there is a little bit here of uh, interaction with our uh, audience. Uh, let me see, okay. So um, uh, this is, um, again, an interactive session. Let's see how things will go. All right, so for uh, our audience to, to participate, if you can just scan this uh, code or just write in your browser slido.com and enter the, the meeting uh, number, you will be able to, uh, to participate. And I think that would be quite interesting. So I'll give you a little bit of time. Okay, wonderful, people are joining. Okay, so again, scan this uh, barcode or uh, write in the browser slido.com and meeting number 928390. All right. Interesting, we have people from different places. All right, uh, so um, the next question here, I think many people are still trying to connect, but let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, all right. Uh, so what is your specialty? An endocrinologist, endocrine surgeon, nuclear medicine specialist, an internist, oncologist, radiation oncologist, nurse, or other specialities? Okay. So these two slides are just to get you uh, familiar with the system. Okay, so I will go to the case. So this is a, a, a 23-year-old girl who presented early in early 2014. I'm highlighting this because this is before the guidelines of 2015. She uh, presented with right lower neck swelling for one year. She had no pressure symptoms, no hypo or hyperthyroid symptoms. Her past medical history was only positive for sickle cell trait but was negative for history of external irradiation. She has negative family history for thyroid cancer. And her physical examination at that time showed that she was euthyroid with right thyroid nodule around three centimeter, mobile, non-tender with no palpable lymph nodes. So this is a kind of straightforward young woman who uh, noticed the swelling in the lower neck for one year with no other significant uh, history and physical examination confirmed the right uh, thyroid nodule of around three centimeter without lymphadenopathy. Her TSH was 2.3. And this is her ultrasound. Uh, so you can see a nice thyroid, uh, but as you go down, you start to see a nodule of um, 1.7 by 2.4 by 1.3. So the maximum diameter is 2.3. And as you can see, this nodule is isoechoic. Uh, there is a fairly well uh, demarcated margin, moderate vascularity, 
This is the right thyroid lobe with the, with the nodule in the upper pole. And um, the left side is completely normal, uh, both in, uh, in, uh, in uh, transverse and longitudinal view. And this is the, the, the official report, normal thyroid isthmus, right thyroid lobe measuring 17 by 17 by 43 millimeter, containing uh, uh, 13 by 24 by 17 millimeter, iso ecogenic nodule in the upper pole without any calcification. The vascularity is similar to the rest of the thyroid, and the left lobe is normal, no enlarged lymph nodes. So the question here is this, what is the risk of cancer in this node? And should we do FNA? So let's see what is the, the answer from our audience. So what is the risk of malignancy in this nodule that you have just seen? Uh, I gave you the choices here of five to 10%, 40 to 50%, 70 to 80% or more than 90% or I don't know. Okay, so the majority think that the risk here is around five to 10%. Let's go to the next question. Does she need FNA? So I'm going to ask at this time, Dr. Haugen, uh, do you agree with the audience that the risk is only five to 10% and would you do FNA for this nodule? So to answer the second question first, yes, I would do an FNA of this nodule. Um, I didn't see a number that I would think on that list. I think it's higher than five to 10. In general, I think it is five to 10, but when you have younger patients, you have a higher risk. So I, I would have put this a little bit higher than that because the patient's young, but it's isoechoic. It's a low risk nodule, but this is in a young patient. So yes, I'd biopsy it. And I think I, if I had to throw a number out there, I'd say 20 to 30% risk. Uh, very good. Dr. Leidenson, you have any additional uh, um, comment on this? Well, Dr. <clears throat> Haugen took the words right out of my mouth. I, uh, you know, I think in the son ultrasound exam, there was a suggestion of a kind of a micro spongy form appearance, which is reassuring. But as uh, Dr. Haugen is pointing out here in pediatric series of nodules, 40 to 50% uh, can be malignant. So I, I think the risk was in that 20 to 30% range. And even if it was 5 to 10%, obviously, uh, fine needle biopsy is uh, important. Excellent. Okay. So I just sh show here the, the ATA pattern recognition uh, for ultrasound. And this is, uh, this is similar to this nodule. So it's 5 to 10% in general, but it's probably much higher uh, for this young uh, girl. So uh, we proceeded with, the, oh, the patient has FNA from outside and was sent to our hospital and we um, looked at it again. Uh, the diagnosis from outside is, uh, is basically proliferative follicular lesion, suggestive of follicular neoplasm or cellular adenomatous nodule, and the review by our pathologist is that this is atibia of undetermined significance slash follicular lesion of undetermined significance, that is the three. So I think the question here, again, what should we do next? Should we observe this, do molecular testing, repeat FNA, or proceed with right lobectomy? And I'm going to pose this for the audience. So what would you do for this uh, uh, ATP of unknown significance? So 71 will do molecular testing, um, spending $3,500 to $4,000. Uh, 16 would just go to the bottom line and operate on the patient. 14% uh, repeat FNA and 4% observe. Okay, we give more time, a little bit more time here to see how things will settle down at the end. Okay, Dr. Leidenson, what would you do for this lesion in 2014? 
Well, uh, the patient's voice in this matter and her family's voice would play an important role. And there are certainly some patients who will not be satisfactorily reassured without surgery. And it would not be crazy, uh, given the risk of malignancy in a younger patient with AUS, which is going to remain in the 25 to you know, 30% range uh, to go directly to surgery. Many patients, however, would prefer to exhaust all non-surgical options. And I think a molecular test, for example, with the, the genomic sequencing classifier, if that returned definitively benign, that would have about a 96% negative predictive value, which I think would permit observation. I, I would say in our practice in the US, probably two thirds of patients would prefer after being advised of all this to have a molecular test and we would feel comfortable doing that. Very good. Uh, Brian, you have any comment on this? Yeah, I agree with everything that Paul said. I think the one thing that you did, which is good, whenever we see a patient with an outside biopsy, and if it, especially if it's uh, Bethesda 3, AUS plus, we always relook at it um, because many times our cytopathologists can change that. The other thing I would ask my cytopathologist is, is, did you see nuclear atypia that was concerning in that AUS? If there is, I'm a little more worried and maybe I'd lean a little bit toward a lobectomy versus a, a molecular, but I, I totally agree with Paul is you need to involve this patient and, and whoever they're with to, to help guide uh, the decision-making here. Because I think molecular testing is reasonable. Um, a surgery is reasonable. I don't think I would just monitor this patient. Uh, do you still see my slides first? Because I did a little bit. Uh, you see the slides? Yeah. OK, great. OK, uh, remember, this is in 2014. Uh, the Bethesda guidelines at that time says, um, uh, I think, repeat or do molecular testing. We don't have the molecular testing. And uh, we repeated it, actually. And uh, this time, the result came back uh, clearer. Uh, so the, the repeat FNA was suspicious for papillary thyroid cancer. And I think now um, uh, uh, people uh, would uh, uh, proceed with surgery. But I think the question that uh, would come here, uh, what type of surgery? Should we do right uh, hemithyroidectomy, lobectomy, or total thyroidectomy? And I would like also to seek the opinion of the audience before we hear from our experts. So the majority so far are choosing a total thyroidectomy. Well, 50-50. Okay. Give more time. So remember the ultrasound. Uh, essentially, there were no lymphadenopathy, and the left side of the thyroid was normal. Okay, Dr. Ladenson, what type of surgery would you do for this young woman with the features that we heard? Well, uh, here again, patient preference uh, plays an important role in our practice. Another factor that plays an important role is the availability of an outstanding thyroid surgeon who one could be confident would safely do a bilateral thyroidectomy, something that I know, you know, at your institution, Dr. Alzarani, you could be confident about. Um, I think given the size of this patient's uh, papillary thyroid cancer, the fact that the positive predictive value for papillary cancer with a Bethesda 6 biopsy is 98%, uh, I would favor a bilateral thyroidectomy. Uh, even if this patient had a, a hemithyroidectomy, uh, if the diagnosis of papillary thyroid cancer is confirmed, uh, lifelong thyroid hormone therapy, I think, is going to be advisable. And uh, I think the uh, long-term monitoring of a patient like this over the next uh, 60 to 70 years, inshallah, uh, will be easier after bilateral surgery. Okay. Uh, Brian, uh, you would always uh, agree with Dr. Ladens, and I know 
I learned from Dr. Ladenson. I always agree with Dr. Ladenson. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think, again, we'd, I'd talk to them about it and see what, as, as far as w what they felt, because you could always go back and do a completion if you have to. Um, so, but I totally agree that we want, we need to have a surgeon who's, because even, even in the hands of outstanding surgeons, the risk of hypoparathyroidism, especially, not so much bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve damage, but permanent hypoparathyroidism is higher with a thyroidectomy than a lobectomy, even in the hands of the best high volume surgeons. So I think we need to inform the patient of that. And I, I don't think either one is a perfect or a wrong answer. Wonderful. And actually, this is reflected in the choice of the audience. You see the, the tie is, is very close. Uh, 58 versus 42, emphasizing the, the controversy around this issue. Anyway, this is what we did. We did actually write hemipyroidectomy. Uh, the pathology came as papillary thyroid, I'm sorry, papillary thyroid carcinoma encapsulated uh, follicular variant. And I think that explains to some extent the ultrasound features and the difficulty in the, in the FNA. The tumor was three centimeter in the greatest dimension was positive for lymphovascular invasion. There is no definite capsular invasion and no extrathyroidal extension. Surgical uh, resection margins are free and uh, the TNM staging is T2 NX MX. Uh, so now uh, we come into the next difficulty again uh, question. Should we do completion thyroidectomy or not? Let me see again the opinion of the audience before we hear from the experts. So would you do completion thyroidectomy with that pathology um, report? Or you want to ask Dr. Ladenson and Haugen? <laughs> All right, so um, the majority would like to proceed with completion thyroidectomy. And I will start this time with Dr. Haugen so he doesn't agree with Dr. Ladenson. Uh, would you go for <laughs> would you go for completion thyroidectomy? Um, I would agree with whatever Dr. Ladenson is going to say. <laughs> um, uh, but I in this, I wouldn't push the patient for a completion thyroidectomy at this point. Obviously, the discussion we had before, there were probably reasons not to do that in the first place. Um, I would give them the options, but I would, I would personally, because the big thing is, is we have to make the patients comfortable with the plan and we have to be comfortable with the plan. I must admit, when I, when I get referrals from other endocrinologists, I'm more often trying to calm down the other endocrinologist than I am the patient. Um, and so I, I think I would be comfortable monitoring this patient. Um, and I believe this is probably going to be a RAS or a RET driven tumor, not a BRAF driven tumor. Um, so I, and this is maybe where, again, as Dr. Ladenson said, do, do we add in 2022 molecular testing to, to sort of see if this, heaven forbid, was a BRAF TERT tumor, then I would say, yes, we should do a completion of thyroidectomy, even without great data, follow-up data on that, but I'd be more worried. So um, I still would work with the patient on it, and I could go either way as the treating physician. Um, I would want to make the patient comfortable. Before I hear from Dr. Ladenson, I can tell you in 90% of our patients, the answer would be, you're the doctor and whatever you advise me, I'll be happy uh, to do. Uh, so um, uh, I think I actually remember this discussion with this young woman and her father, and uh, that was really what, what uh, they told me. So Dr. Ladenson, what would you do under these circumstances? It's my pleasure on this occasion to agree with Dr. Haugen. And uh, I, I think I would favor uh, letting this patient take advantage of her decision to have a lobectomy and uh, would be satisfied for now with the lobectomy, knowing that if in the future uh, her thyroglobulin was inordinately elevated, there was a nodular lesion appearing in the residual lobe, uh, or other factors emerged, one could always later do a completion thyroidectomy, but I really think there's no need to do so now. And uh, I don't know whether you're going to be asking about radioiodine therapy, Ali, but I, I think it would have no proven benefit in a, a case of this magnitude. Okay. 
I'm really sorry that I would disagree with you. In 2014, I would agree with you today. Remember, this is even before uh, uh, Brian's uh, uh, guidelines and, um, and before uh, uh, the, the study of the New England Journal of Medicine. So we proceeded actually with uh, completion thyroidectomy because of this lymphovascular invasion, we were a bit worried, follicular type of uh, tumor. I agree that we could have chosen just to follow the patient, but again, this is back in 2014, and the lymphovascular invasion was a little bit worrisome for us. So we went ahead and did left completion thyroidectomy uh, without any complications, and it was a benign uh, uh, cyto uh, histology. So I think uh, I'm bringing the question that you uh, raised, Dr. Laydens, and would you give this patient iodine-131? And uh, let me uh, hear from the audience before I uh, uh, ask you. So who is going to prescribe I-131 ablation for this patient? It's interesting. 50-50, um, 60-40, 50-50. Um, <laughs> All right. Okay, so it seems that the majority will give radioactive iodine ablation. Let's see if. Um... Okay, uh, Dr. Ladenson, would you get? You have already uh, told us in your lecture that this is not good for this type of patients, but um, consider that you are seeing this patient in 2014 again. Yes. Well, it's hard to forget that we've been educated by Dr. Le Bellieu's, uh prospective randomized trial. This patient, by the way, doesn't quite fit into that trial in the sense that their patients had tumors less than two centimeters. But I think there is no demonstrated uh, benefit of radioiodine in terms of disease-free survival risk. Uh, recurrence-free survival. And I think we are instructed uh, by the other very recent trial regarding complications from Dr. Kitahara's group in a young patient like this. Uh, remember that in 20-year survivors, uh, all solid tumors and uh, among those almost significantly more common breast cancer was more common in 20 year survivors. So I, th I think I would prefer to follow this patient off uh, or absent radioiodine uh, adjunctive therapy. Okay, I'll not ask you, Brian, on this. Uh, we'll move. We have given this patient 55 millicuri of radioactive iodine in uh, November 2015. This is the pre therapy scan, post therapy scan. Uh, the uptake was uh, in the range, I think, of 1%. Uh, and her TG before uh, treatment was not that high. I don't see it well here. Uh, but antibody negative and the ultrasound was clear. And this is her follow-up. Yeah, it was four, actually. Uh, her follow-up throughout the years showed that she achieved an excellent response. I'm not saying that the radioactive iodine was the reason probably she would have done well anyway without radioactive iodine, but 55 millicuri may not have been that uh, harmful. And um, as you can see, the late the last time I saw her was uh, early in the month with the undetectable thyroglobulin, uh, negative antibodies, and a TSH that is in the target and negative ultrasound. So any final comment on this case, uh, Dr. Haugen? Does this patient have, does this patient have hyperparathyroidism? Um, I just saw the Hyper. PGHs on here, or is it we are vitamin not, D deficiency? Yeah, yeah, thank you for, yeah. We are, we are seeing an, uh, an epidemic of this in our hospital. And I think oh. we have a problem with our lab rather than a real one. We have talked to the chemist many, many times. So uh, this is why I, I even did not uh, notice it myself because it's coming frequently. Oh, so she doesn't have hyperparathyroidism. Her calcium is okay. I think there's a problem with the, with the with she the probably had a vitamin D deficiency here, but uh, you can see her parathyroid hormone is coming down. But again, yeah. uh, 
it, no. it's normal. Uh, nothing, nothing major there. And your your point, Ali, about the, the thyroglobulin coming down, definitely, obviously, we can see that with radioiodine remnant ablation, but those patients we followed who do have positive thyroglobulins, many of them over the years, even if they haven't received radioiodine, the thyroglobulin sure. can go down. Absolutely. Uh, and especially this was stimulated, and uh, I'm sure if we had put her on thyroxine, she would have uh, suppressed her thyroglobulin even without radioactive iodine. But I think this reflects basically the change in um, in practice over the years. Again, this is in 2014 when the enthusiasm to treat those patients was much higher than now. Uh, but I think again, the case reflects the bread and butter of uh, of, of our practice uh, in uh, thyroid cancer. Uh, we are. This is the, the last slide. Let me see if there are some burning questions uh, that I can ask you uh, to answer briefly. Um, okay, so here's a question that uh, is more of logistic. Who should follow the patient postoperatively, the endocrine surgeon or the endocrinologist? I would say the endocrinologist. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, and the rest of the comments, uh, they are not questions actually. They are more of um, of comments on the on the case. Uh, uh, so here's a, a comment that lymphovascular invasion is considered as an important, is it considered as important as vascular invasion? So I think the question here, when you see in the histopathological report, lymphovascular invasion, should we take that as vascular invasion? Um, Dr. Leidenson or Dr. Haugen? Well, one of the... Uh fine points of the Lebeu study was that certain microscopic findings, including lymphovascular invasion and microscopic invasion, did not predict benefit of radioiodine remnant ablation. So I, I think it is not so serious a finding. I, I would just say in closing that your decision to use radioiodine here, though, did confer some benefit to the patient. All of these undetectable thyroglobulin values that you see here mean that you're less dependent on imaging with its high sensitivity and low specificity. And, uh, and those undetectable TGs can be reassuring to a patient who has an indeterminate lymph node. It may mean that you don't have to biopsy it. It may mean that you can forego sonographic monitoring altogether after a few years. So, so there is benefit even today to what you chose to do. I think it was quite reasonable. Uh, one question here, low risk BTC with the size more than four centimeter with no other risk factors. Can we consider radioactive iodine ablation? So if you have a tumor more than four centimeter without any other um, uh, high risk features, the size alone, is that enough to consider radioactive iodine, Dr. Haugen? I mean, I, I take it that this is in a patient who's had their thyroid completely removed um, rather than a, trying to ablate a lobe. But I think greater than four centimeters is where we struggle with the data. Um, and so I think that is considered in that higher intermediate risk category where we definitely can consider radioiodine um, until we have better data. Very good. Okay, I am really sorry that we have exceeded the time. I, uh, we really enjoyed very much this session. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Leidenson and Dr. Haugen. And thank you for the audience. And thank you for Dr. Uh, Samargandhi for uh, presenting very uh, interesting case, challenging case. Uh, I think with that, we'll close uh, the session and uh, hope to see you in the near future. Thank you. Bye-bye.